Okay, hey, um, I'm Fatima. Welcome to the stream. So today we're going to be talking about AP government and the Articles of, of Confederation. So we're just going to wait a couple of seconds before like the email goes out and see for more a few more people trickle in. So hi, Ashley. Uh, okay, so while we're waiting, what's y'all's favorite ice cream? I'm partial to chocolate chip cookie dough, but you know, all of them are good to eat, I guess. I actually, I'm not saying I don't like mint ice cream, but like, I've never tried it. So I just can't imagine that taste of like cold mint ice cream. But, you know, to each their own, I guess. <laughs> so how was everyone's week so far? It's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. I know I'm looking forward to the weekend. Oh, is anyone actually taking the ACT this weekend? Because I know it's happening. I'm taking it this weekend, so like. Okay. Okay, well, we're gonna get started. Okay, so first things first. Um, this is fiveable, obviously. That's what we're here to talk about. And so one reason I joined Fiveable personally is because I think it's super important for AP curriculum to be accessible to everyone. And so like it's an even playing field. Everyone's getting access to the same resources because as more and more colleges begin to accept AP credit as like credit for actual college courses, I think that everyone should have an equal chance to actually get that credit in the long run. So that's why I joined Fiveable. Um, okay, so today we're going to be talking about the Articles of Confederation. My name's Fatma Raja, and before we get started, make sure you're following Fiveable on across all their social media platforms. It's at Think Fiveable on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. So if you're interested, go ahead and give them a follow because they post updates about who's going to be streaming, like on Instagram on their stories, and then super me super funny memes on like all of their platforms. So those are fun to look at when you're studying for AP exams. <laughs> okay, so another thing before we get started, here's some AP Gov streams that are coming up. So if you're taking AP Gov as either a semester course or a year long course, you're going to want to tune in. Um, there's one on the 17th of September, one on the 19th, one on the 20th, and one on the 23rd. So we have around like four or five AP Gov streamers, so we're going to all be like rotating through them. So tune in if you want to learn more about AP Gov and make sure you get like a good score on the exam. So there you go. Um, so my name's Fatma. I am not an incoming senior anymore. I am a senior in high school. I live in Houston and I do debate and I went to DC this summer. So if you're curious, just let me know and I'll tell you about it. Okay, so before we get started, what do you guys know about the Articles of Confederation? Because there's a lot of like knowledge when it comes to government that is really important to have. And I know that like sometimes like I didn't know what the Articles of Confederation were for like a hot second. So where are you guys coming from? Like, what do you know or not know about the Articles of Confederation yet that you would like to find out or something that you think is super interesting about it? Uh, so Ashley asked, wasn't it like a pre-constitution that failed? Yeah, that's actually exactly what the Articles of Confederation were. Um, so it was pretty much the trial and error version of the American government before the constitution was ratified and that became our new form of government. So let's get started. Okay, so like I just said, what were the Articles of Confederation? So this was the original constitution of the United States and it was ratified in 1871. So right below that like explanation of the constitution, I put like a little political um, cartoon, I guess, that was like a symbol of 
how everyone wanted the 13 colonies to join together and become more unified because they were saying that if they were divided against the British government, it would pretty much mean the end of like colonial life. So that was like a little bit dramatic, I guess you could say, but um, yeah. The cartoon just was a call for unity across all of the colonies in order to make sure that they actually stood a chance against the British government when it came to fighting in the revolution or actually negotiating with the government. So the background of the Articles of Confederation is the first thing we're gonna talk about. So before we actually talk about what the Articles of Confederation were, I think it's really important to establish some context for when they got passed and what the reasons for that structure was. So when the Articles of Confederation were actually like ratified across like all 13 colonies, the Revolutionary War had already started. So Lexington and Concord, so the shot heard around the world, that had already happened. So this was pretty much like grind time for the people at the Constitutional Congress, the second Constitutional Congress to be specific, because they needed a governing body in order to make sure that it wasn't just like a bunch of different colonies trying to fight different fights and that there was a like goal there was a plan and somebody had a strategy in mind when it came to fighting the revolutionary war and so that's what the articles of confederation were partly for in order to have a structure in order to make sure that all of the colonies were cooperating so the Articles of Confederation was ratified by all 13 states, and so they entered into something called the League of Friendship. And so this phrase is going to be super important in like the coming slides, but what it pretty much means is that they weren't just one like unified nation. They were sort of like a bunch of friends hanging out together. And so even though it was called the United States of America, it was more of like a bunch of different separating, separated sovereign bodies that were working together. And so, yeah, we'll delve more into that later on. And so some more historical context is that the reason why people were fighting in the Revolutionary War was because these colonists in America, they were rebelling against the British Empire for violating their rights. So things that became rallying cries like taxation without representation. And the reason why we have the Fourth Amendment now, which says, Third Amendment? Yes, Amendment now, that says you can't quarter soldiers is because of things that the like British government was forcing the colonists to do. And so because their rights were being violated, the entire structure of the Articles of Confederation was built on making sure that a government couldn't have tyrannical power in the long run. So that's what the authors of the Articles of Confederation did. They decentralized power to make sure that one central governing body couldn't impose its will on all of the separate states and different peoples around the states. So that's why every individual colony and quote unquote state had a lot of governing autonomy because everyone wanted to make sure that their states were representing their interests rather than a federal governing body that like virtual representation wasn't actually involved in the day-to-day -day issues that each state was dealing with. So that's why the Articles of Confederation are structured the way that they are because people were trying to make sure that they weren't oppressed by a federal government. So these are some key dates to remember in terms of formation so you might have gone over them in ap us history if you've taken it but um the articles of confederation were debated and they were written from 1776 to 1777 so over the course of those two years it was pretty much established that these this is what the articles of confederation are going to be about and this is how the government is going to be structured so obviously a lot of debate went into making sure that the Articles of Confederation were actually a governing body that would work because they spent about two years on actually writing them and drafting them. So obviously those two years didn't work out in the long run because we now have the constitution, but they were an important trial in 
people disagreeing and dissenting on how a government should actually work. So it set a good precedent for when it came to the Constitution. So the Constitutional Congress adopted the Articles on November 15th of 1777, but it took almost two years for the Articles to be fully ratified by all 13 states. So it happened in March 1st of 1781. And the reason why that was, was because there was a lot of debates over key um, key provisions of the Articles of Constitution. So things like when it came to each state having one vote and congressional representation and claims over land in the West, those were a lot of things that people were disagreeing about when it came to the Articles of Confederation. So that's why it took so long for all 13 colonies slash states to ratify them. So now let's find out what the structure of the Articles of Confederation was. And so now we're used to having a federal government that has three different branches, but the Article of Confederation was different because there was only one Congress, um, no other branches. It was only a legislative branch and it was one House of Congress. There was no executive branch, no judicial branch, and it, isn't, it wasn't like it is now where we have two houses of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives. It was just each state got one representative and that person went to Congress and that was one of the people that helped the federal government run. And so the other like main governing body that was intended in the Articles of Confederation was state governments. And that's like all the other state governments. And so they were just run based on how the state constitution was written. And so all of them were separate from the federal government and they had a lot of their own power. So those were the two main governing bodies in the Articles of Confederation. Okay, so quick question. What problems do you guys think that a lack of executive and judicial branch would cause? And so there's no wrong answers here. You can like totally guess like if you have no idea what a lack of judicial and executive branch and its problems might be, that's totally fine. So, okay, so, okay, so it would mean that the government couldn't write tax laws or tax people very well. Well, yeah, that might be one of the problems because one of the functions of the executive branch, for example, is to make sure that laws are being enforced. So the executive branch that we have now is the head, is the president, is the commander in chief of the military. So, and like, for example, when they were trying to desegregate schools, um, like specifically, I think it was Little Rock, they sent um, troops to make sure that it was happening because desegregation actually wasn't happening on this like scale. And there was a governor that was trying to prevent it. And I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but I can get back to you guys if you want it later. But okay, so yeah, there's a lot of problems that a lack of executive and judicial branch could have. And that was like one of the lessons that the drafters of the Articles of Confederation learned. So Congress, the only branch of government that exists in the Articles of Confederation, we need to understand what powers it had. So Congress could do a few things. It could regulate foreign affairs. So things like wars and dealing with other countries' diplomats and sending ambassadors, that was something that Congress would do. And it would also regulate the Postal Service to make sure that everyone gets their mail on time. That's one of the most important things that our federal government does now. And it was also something that the federal government was intended to do then. Congress would also control Indian affairs. So if there were ever any disputes over land when it came to Native Americans or when it came to writing treaties, Congress was pretty much in charge of that. Congress could also borrow money. So that's something that our federal government does now. Um, and it's also something that Congress could do then. So sometimes you might need money in order to fund infrastructure projects or any other thing. Congress was allowed to do that. Um, it was also in charge of determining the value of money and like coin. So the reason why that was important was because they had like a lot of separate currencies. And so having like one Minnesotan dollar, Minnesota was not a state back then, by the way, but for example, having one Minnesotan dollar be equivalent to who knows how many like Mississippi dollars was kind of confusing. So Congress was in charge of having like one like dollar bill that was standard across all of states. 
all the states. And so it was also supposed to issue bills of credit. And so those were like the important jobs that Congress had. So you think those are a lot, but we'll learn about why it became problematic in the long run. So obviously we don't have the Articles of Confederation now, but it set a really good basis for what our government could be and needed to be. So let's look into some of the pros of having the Articles of Confederation. So some of those, one of those was with they were able to solve a lot of problems. So for example, a lot of states had different claims to Western land. So because the 13 colonies all had land to the West of them, there was a lot of dispute over the lands, especially when two states had access to an area of land. So one of the things that happened through the Articles of Confederation was people were able to come to an agreement over whose land would belong to what state. So it prevented states from being in long drawn out feuds over specific areas of land. Another thing that happened over under the Articles of Confederation was the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was passed. And this was actually super important. And you might remember it from AP US history, but if you don't, that's totally fine. It pretty much just went, meant that territories that were north of the Ohio River were going to have a path to statehood. So it did a lot of different things that allowed for a precedent to be set for other states to gain statehood in the future. And another thing that ended up happening is that it outlawed slavery in the Northwest Territory. So I'm not gonna like dive in specifically to what the Northwest Ordinance did. It's on the slide if you wanna read it, but it's important to remember that the Articles of Confederation did allow for people to actually have some different opinions that were solved, settled, and they could move on to having a constitution that was focused on things that weren't land claims specifically. But obviously, the reason why we don't have the Articles of Confederation now are very complex. So why do you guys think that the Articles of Confederation were replaced? Because there's a lot of different reasons, but why do you guys think that the constitution was replaced, or the Articles of Confederation were replaced with the Constitution. Okay, so Ashley says, because she doesn't know. Totally fine. Okay, so we're going to look into why the Articles of Confederation were replaced. So, there were a lot of cons when it came to the Articles of Confederation. So it was drafted under an idea and the drafters of government were very scared of a tyrannical government. But that also meant that there was a huge lack of federal power. And so the federal government wasn't allowed to tax states, which meant that they had to depend on different states taxing its people and the state giving money to the federal government. So the federal government had absolutely no way to raise funds. And that became very problematic because states didn't want to impose taxes and give money to the federal government. So because states were obviously also dealing with issues that the Revolutionary War had caused, like their own state debt, they didn't also want to raise taxes even more to give money to the federal government. So that became problematic because then the federal government couldn't pay back its own wartime debt. And so in the long run, that was really bad for the American economy because countries didn't want to lend money to the American like government, which meant that there was a lack of financial diuretic. <clears throat> if you have watched the Hamilton musical, you'll get that reference. Um, that was like existed in the American economy, which led to a very inactive federal branch. So the federal government couldn't really do anything to help states when it came to enforcing laws or anything. But that, on that same note, the federal government couldn't draft any troops. It had to depend on state governments to provide it with troops. It couldn't impose tariffs, which meant that American farmers and manufacturers were hurt because when other countries imposed tariffs, then it meant that American farmers couldn't access their markets, but the American government also couldn't protect American farmers by making their goods more affordable than other foreign goods, which meant that American farmers and manufacturers weren't as competitive, which hurt them in the long run. And 
the federal government also couldn't regulate interstate commerce. And we'll get into why that was super problematic in a couple of slides. But what we're realizing now is that a lack of federal power means that there's no centralized entity to make sure that decisions are being made across the board that might be very helpful when it comes to leading a country in terms of things like tariffs. So question, before we get into why there were different disadvantages when it came to state laws, why do you guys think that states having different characteristics, things like population or maybe their economy would lead to disagreement and be in the long run problematic? Whoops. Okay. Yeah, so Ashley says that they would have different priorities. Um, yeah, that's actually exactly what the issue would be. So state sovereignty became really problematic because states retained, and this is a quote from the actual Articles of Confederation, um, that every power which wasn't, it, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States would be given to like the actual separate state governments, which me meant that the United States federal government only had the powers that the Articles of Confederation stated it had. Anything else, the state was in charge of. So it meant that any gray areas or issues that arose during the time under the Articles of Confederation, it didn't really mean that the federal government could be an impartial party that was solving the issue the state governments were free to feud as they chose to. So one of the problems that did end up arising is that states weren't helping each other pay off debts. So some states had huge debts from the American Revolution and others had economies that were doing completely fine. So this became problematic because Southern states that weren't as affected by the American Revolution and had like huge cash crop economies they were doing fine after the war, but Northern states, states like Massachusetts and New York, they had a lot of damage because of how the war had been so centralized in that area, but also because their economies were a lot smaller and their manufacturing base wasn't as strong. So this meant that there was also other problems because states were trying to compete with each other when it came to having strong economies. And so they would tariff each other because they were allowed to do that and the federal government wasn't allowed to say anything about it because it couldn't regulate interstate commerce, which now we're learning is a very bad thing because states would literally just be like, if you're a farmer from any other state, you have to pay or people have to pay more money to get your products because we want people to buy farmers products that are in our state. So states would literally just feuds with each other and like impose tariffs on one another and obviously if you have like interstate feuding happening within your own country you're not as unified and as competitive in the global economic market because people are too busy fighting with each other so that became really problematic but another problem was voting became a very difficult thing to do and reach a consensus on because like i said earlier each state only had one vote in Congress, which meant that there was no proportional voting like in the House of Representatives. And it was pretty much like the Senate where everyone gets two representatives, except in this version, everyone only gets one. Um, the Articles of Confederation also said that you could only amend or pass a new law if nine of 13 votes were in agreement of that happening. And if you do some math, it's very difficult for nine states that have very different interests to come to an agreement, especially when there's only 13 states total. So think about it. If New York, which has an economy that's based primarily in manufacturing and fishing and other northern state things, is arguing over a specific tariff when it comes to farming on other countries' goods, and the other state in question is Virginia, which is based in cash crops and farming, it's obvious that they're not gonna reach a consensus. So this proportional voting system or non-proportional voting system meant that 
nothing really got done. So every single time the drafters and people in Congress faced an issue, they couldn't do anything about it because there was so much sectional disagreement because of different state interests that people couldn't actually come to a single consensus. So nothing happened besides like the Northwest Ordinance. So this also led to states with that had very large populations feeling underrepresented because a very small state, oh, quick question. Ashley asked, wouldn't that help the states as a whole then? Um, okay, so this is kind of complicated because yes, potentially each state could have more of a say and all of their votes would count be counted as equal. So in theory, it would mean that every state is going to want to do what is best for the entire country, but that's not actually what ended up happening. It ended up being dominated by sectional interests. So things that people in the southern states might agree on wasn't actually something that people in the northern states ended up agreeing on. So there wasn't actually a lot of productive things that actually happened because states weren't actually aiming to help everyone, they were aiming to help themselves, which sounds very selfish when you say it like that, but it was actually making a little bit of sense because they were trying to make sure that the people that they represented were doing well. And so, yeah, um, back to what I was saying, states with large populations felt super underrepresented because it meant that if you had a huge population, it only meant you had one representative and it didn't matter how many more people were there, your vote counted equally even if there was one person living in another state and you had 3,000 people, it didn't matter because you only had one vote. And so even though there wasn't one person in a state, you get what I mean. So do you guys know what the tipping point for a new constitution was? And it was a lot of combined problems, but there's one specific event that we look to in AP government when we're talking about why we got the Constitution instead of the Articles of Confederation. Okay, Shays Rebellion? Yes, that is absolutely correct. We all look to the Shays Rebellion as the reason why we got the Constitution instead of the Articles of Confederation. It was a really defining moment that tested the Articles of Confederation and the Articles obviously failed that test. So let me set the scene. It was the summer of 1786 and Massachusetts farmers had a lot of wartime debt because they hadn't been able to pay taxes because a lot of farmers in Massachusetts were fighting the Revolutionary War. So Congress decided that they would pay all of the farmers for their service in the Revolutionary War. But this is where it becomes super important. Congress didn't have taxing power. And because state governments weren't giving it any money, it couldn't actually pay those farmers back, which meant that the farmers couldn't pay back their debts. So they ended up facing jail time and their land being taken away from them by debtors. So the Massachusetts farmers were super upset. But to compound those issues, the state of Massachusetts also imposed high taxes to pay off its state debts. So like we talked about earlier, northern states tended to have more debt because that's where a lot of the fighting was concentrated. So Massachusetts had higher taxes and the farmers couldn't afford them to begin with, but on top of that, Massachusetts wanted to pay off its own state debts, which Congress couldn't help with because it didn't have any money. So those were the causes of Shays' Rebellion. So there was a man named Daniel Shays, who the rebellion is named after, who led a bunch of farmers to the local courthouse. And so the reason why that is super important is because of the fact that they were dissenting against the government's actions and that was pretty much the reason that people had like asked for a new government right like this is literally examples of the american government facing dissent and people being allowed to do that rather than being silenced or shut down so 
the local militiamen who were supposed to be in charge of making sure that this kind of stuff didn't happen, didn't arrest the farmers because they sympathized with them. A lot of the militiamen had fought in the revolution and understood that the reason why the farmers couldn't pay back the debt wasn't because they were bad citizens, it was just because they were supposed to have been paid and they weren't given money that they could actually pay back those debts with. So they didn't actually arrest any of the farmers that were protesting at the courthouse. So. The governor asked the federal government for help, which would be the next logical step. But Congress couldn't provide any funds or troops because states weren't giving it any. So the fact that the governor, who was not giving Congress any money, asked Congress and the federal government to help them solve a problem, you see the issue here because the reason why the problem wasn't being solved is because of the states and governors in the first place. So Shay's Rebellion happened and the federal government couldn't do anything and the state government couldn't do anything. So it pretty much meant that everyone understood that we were at a tipping point. The impact of Shay's Rebellion was that states realized that there was a need for a federal government that could tax states and have raising and raise troops. So it meant that people realize that the federal government needs a lot more power than it has now. And so members of Congress decided to amend the Articles of Confederation. And so what ended up happening at those meetings for the Constitutional Convention was that the Constitutional Constitution was written rather than just amending the Articles of Confederation because people had realized that the Articles of Confederation were flawed in a lot more ways than just not being able to help states prevent Shays Rebellion or other similar uprisings. So that's how we got the Constitution. People realized that the Articles of Confederation were more of a trial run. And although they had worked in wartime where the federal government didn't have a huge need for conducting foreign policy or paying off debts, it was very important to have a stronger federal government in the post-war time era because that government would be in charge of making sure that taxation happens, infrastructure would be built, states didn't have feuds over things like them tariffing each other. So that's why people realized that the federal government being a little bit stronger than it is would be a beneficial thing to the country in the long run. And as long as there were checks and balances, which were written into the Constitution, we could make sure that federal power was checked and wasn't oppressing people or being super tyrannical. So people also took away that states have a lot of conflicting interests that get in the way of unity. So if you look, for example, at a state like Virginia, which has a lot of cash crops, it's not gonna agree with economic policy necessarily with a state like New York, which has a more manufacturing base, or at least it did back in the colonial era. So people realized that having a strong federal government would be a better thing than what a lot of people thought. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, that's going to be the end of the slides. But yeah, those are all the main key points from the Articles of Confederation. Oh, thanks, Ashley. <laughs> I appreciate that. So I think it's really important for everyone to remember that it's totally okay if you walk into these streams not knowing a lot, because the entire point of them is for us to make sure that we can teach you and engage with you guys. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Whoever is the host will be happy to answer, even if it's not me. So I'm going to sign off in like a minute or so. So if you have any questions, ask them now. Okay, well, good night, everyone. I'm signing off. Thanks for tuning in.